Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of W102. So a few quick announcements. Uh, today is Wednesday. I'm posting this lecture after we had office hours today. Um, so I'm just going to repeat some announcements. The fourth homework, uh, based on the poll, it's been decided that uh, in general, fourth homework and all homeworks hereafter will actually uh, have a no questions asked extension until Sunday uh, for full credit. So you no longer have to turn in the homeworks on Friday. But those of you who do turn in the homeworks by Friday, you'll get 1% extra credit on that particular assignment. Um, a number of people have asked if this means that the homework category will get 1%. Well, yeah, the answer is yes, because your homework grade itself is going to go up by 1% for that particular assignment. We're just going to knock, uh, tack on 1% to it. So indeed, you would affect your homework grade. Uh, midterm grading and solutions. So uh, the solutions have been posted right after the last person has finished their exam, and the grading is in progress. Typically, it takes us around a week to do the grading, uh, give or take a few days. OK. So in the last two lectures, we discussed the following. Uh, one lecture covered that a signal, f of t, if it's well-behaved and periodic with some period t naught, can be written as this thing called a Fourier series. And in your homework, uh, homework number four, you are dealing extensively with this equation. So hopefully it is quite familiar to you. In the last lecture, lecture 10, we learned that we could actually solve for the coefficients CK with this integral transform, which we derived in the last lecture. Uh, this is also covered in homework number four. In these two representations, at the, the coefficients CK here, these are called the Fourier coefficients. Fourier coefficients or Fourier series coefficients, right? And this notation here, this summation, is called a Fourier series expansion. Just like we have a Taylor series expansion that we learned in high school, some of us, or in previous calculus classes, you have this Fourier series expansion. And the goal is that f of t is some sort of weighted average of complex exponentials, which are basically just uh, sines and cosines. Today, uh, remember when we first learned about signals, when we first learned about systems, we first introduced them and then we moved on to their properties. So just like signals, just like systems, the Fourier series has its properties that are interesting and relevant. The first one is the C, C, C sub zero. C sub zero is a very special type of coefficient. C sub zero, as it turns out, is actually the average of the signal. So if we look at the previous representation here, um, in this particular case, if I take this equation and rewrite k equals zero, then I end up getting a representation that looks something like this. Now, if I have this equation and you stare at it for a quick moment, you'll see that this is exactly just a mean, right? I'm adding up all the values of f of t in an interval of length t zero, and then I'm dividing by the length of the interval. So this is a classic average. So we had this equation in, in high school calculus, 1 over a to b, you know, f of x. And this was how you took the average of a function. So in like fashion, c sub 0 is an average of your signal. And so it kind of makes a lot of intuitive sense uh, when we dealt with approximating signals, like when we were trying to approximate the square wave, we, we kept adding sine waves to it, right? Like k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, and so on. Uh, it turns out that the sine wave that fits the signal the best, actually, usually is c sub 0, which is not even a sine wave. It's, uh, it's a flat component. But that gets you sort of to the right um, sort of uh, ballpark. 
So let me give you an example. Let's say that in this particular case, I have some signal T and it could be what I'm reading off a voltage line. I might be reading something like this. Okay, so it's a square wave, f of t. And if I want to approximate this by sinusoids, it's not really that helpful for me to draw my first sinusoid here, right? That doesn't really approximate the signal. Uh, a better approximation is simply to draw a line about halfway through, right here. Something like this. Even though it doesn't account for the oscillation, it's actually closer in terms of the mean squared error between the curves. It's closer in terms of the distance between these curves. And so in this particular case, this green would be represented by C0, and the red might be represented by C1. So of course you want both of them. You want C0 and C1, but C0 is very, very important to approximating the signal law. Now, in this particular case, you'll also see that if I have f of t, c0 is drawn about halfway through. It's exactly the sort of mean of that signal. In electrical engineering, a term that you'll hear throughout your careers, when whether you're in upper division classes or in industry, is something called DC versus AC. And so here's an example. In this particular case, I have a plot, and let's say that I have a nine volt battery that's like a, like a direct current. Uh, direct current means there's no sinusoidal component. The voltage is not changing over time. So I have this standard nine volt battery, and if I plot, so this graph, this axis is T, the Y axis is voltage as a function of time, then I should see a flat line here where it intersects about nine volts. Now, I can have a different power source that might be what's called an AC power source or alternating current power source. So an AC source would take the form of something like this, where it oscillates, right? So in this particular case, the DC component is flat and the AC component has the sinusoidal. So in shorthand, uh, what people often say, it doesn't matter if they're working on a voltage line or any type of device, they'll just say, oh, this signal has a very strong DC component, or let's remove the DC component of the signal, or uh, all the interesting stuff is in the AC component. People will really separate your signals with the shorthand. So for example, uh, if I give you these two signals, So these are both, in this case, AC signals. Here's example A, and here's example B. They're nearly identical, but example B has a DC component. And you could remove the DC component to get to signal A if you wanted to by simply calculating the mean of the signal and subtracting it. Right? Or in other words, calculating C0 and subtracting it. So we will come back to this more often in the class, this DC versus AC. But for right now, the take home message from the slide is that C0 is the average of your signal over time. And we also call that the DC component. All right, let's move on to the next property, which is that CK is in general a complex signal, all right? So CK is uh, in general a complex coefficient. So it can be expressed in either real or imaginary form or in magnitude and phase form. So let's say CK is a complex number. So if CK is complex, then clearly a complex number, it has this representation, right? A plus uh, JB, right? Where A is the real part and B is the imaginary part. And you can see that we can simply then separate it here into real and imaginary using that script notation that we introduced in a very early lecture where we spoke about complex numbers. Now, remember that complex numbers can be written in this form 
or they can also be written in this phasor form, where you have a magnitude and a phase. So for example, the phase here, this angle here, gives you the phase spectrum. And the magnitude gives you what's called the amplitude spectrum. So here's an example uh, of an amplitude and phase spectrum. In this particular case, what I have here is I have a signal that's made up of elementary complex exponentials. You have one at 2 pi, you have one at 3 pi, and you have one at 4 pi. Now, the amplitude spectrum, what it gives you, shown here, is it sort of tells you the relative mixtures of each of these components, right? It's telling you, if I just look at the amplitude spectrum, and this is from an earlier lecture, this is the same signal. If I look at the amplitude spectrum, I can see that clearly there are non-zero values at 2 pi, 3 pi, and 4 pi, so these frequencies are represented in my time domain signal. The phase spectrum, in contrast, does not really tell you which frequencies are represented. For example, in the phase spectrum, 2 pi is shown to be 0, uh, which is not really helpful for understanding which frequencies are in the signal. What the phase spectrum allows you to, to sort of ascertain is what is the relative mixture of sines and cosines in the original signal. So the amplitude spectrum. it tells you the mixture of sinusoids. Right, it talks about sinusoids in general, whereas the phase spectrum allows you to delineate between cosines and sines. It tells you the mixture of cosines versus sines. Okay. So moving on, one of the interesting properties that we also care about is symmetry in the Fourier coefficients. So in this particular example, there's a lot of equations on the slide, so let me just break it down. Here is the familiar equation that we have. We're calculating CK over one period. So we have uh, our standard integral transform equation and we've simply replaced um, uh, sort of omega with 2 pi over t naught. So we've just done that uh, replacement directly. Now, starting from this first line, I can apply Euler's formula. So I can apply Euler, and I can expand out the complex exponential to cosine of something minus j sine of something. Once I've done that, I can just do some trivial uh, integral algebra, right? And just split the integral into two integrals. And if I look at this equation, it becomes interesting. So this is just algebra. Because what I have done is, if I think of this quantity as just some number, and this quantity as another number, I have just written CK as a general complex number, right? So when I say sort of this whole quantity as a number and this whole quantity as a number, it's really just, you know, A plus JB, all right? So what that means is that if F of T is real, then the following holds. If f of t is real, then let me draw this with actually two different colors here. So this gives you another number. So if f of t is real, 
then that red number has to also be real by definition, right? Because there's no imaginary parts in that whole integral equation. If I just isolate, so cover up with your hand the blue part, and if you just look at the red part, if I tell you that f of t is real, then it follows that that entire expression in the red box has to be real. Therefore, the real part of c of k has to be what's in that red box. By contrast, if f of t is real, you can use the same logic by extension to say that what's in the blue part is imaginary. You use the exact same logic to say that what's in the blue part is imaginary. And so this gives us a really nice way to isolate the Fourier coefficients and to really ascertain that the real coefficients, for assuming that f of t is real, the real coefficients are the cosines, the projection of f of t onto cosines, and the imaginary coefficients, imaginary part of the coefficients, are the projection of f of t onto sine waves. And we can leverage this phenomena to come up with some basic properties for for your symmetry of the coefficients. For example, since cosine of k is even, remember we learned earlier that cosine is an even function. And we also learned that sine is an odd function. Therefore, if f of t is real, since f of t is in the previous slide multiplying times a cosine, then what you have is that this real part right here is going to have a symmetry of evenness, right? It's going to have the even symmetry equation. And that's shown here. Remember, even symmetry was if I have a signal f of t, it equals f of minus t. In contrast, the imaginary part, if f of t is real, the imaginary part, because the sine wave is odd, the imaginary part, which is comprised of the sine wave, has odd symmetry. And in this case, remember that odd symmetry means that it was anti-symmetric. So there should actually be a minus sign here. OK. So in this particular case, these first two properties are clear from the fact that f of t is real and the fact that cosine and sine are even and odd functions, respectively. Now let's look at the third line here. CK star equals C sub minus K. What exactly is that saying? Well, let's break it down. Let's sort of break it down here. Remember that C sub K in general for F of T being real is going to be the real part of CK plus the imaginary part of CK. Okay. There's also a J here. Now, CK star, what CK star is, is CK star is the complex conjugate. Remember that the complex conjugate, what you do is you negate the imaginary component. So that is real of CK minus J of imaginary of CK, all right? So that's what CK star is. So now what this property here is telling you is it's telling you that somehow these two are equal. So let's kind of, uh, as a check your understanding, if you would like, you can pause the video. So CYU, prove that CK indeed equals CK star. Excuse me. Um, for a check your understanding, you're going to have to prove that C minus K equals 
CK star. Okay. So what you're going to prove is that CK star equals C to the minus K. So feel free to give this an attempt. You can pause the video and then rejoin us in a moment. Okay, welcome back. So in this particular case, we can first use the, we can, as a hint, use the first two properties here. So we have the first line, the first property here allows us to simply write this as real of C sub minus K okay, plus J of the imaginary part of C sub minus K. So we just apply the first two lines here. And if I look at this expression, this is nothing but C sub minus K. Okay, so what this shows is that C star of K equals C sub minus K, which we have just shown in this proof. Now, what about the fourth line? What we're saying is that the magnitude of CK and C minus K are equal. Well, let's take a quick look at our definition of what magnitude is. You may recall that the definition here is that the magnitude of, let's say, some Fourier coefficient CK is going to be equal to the square root of the real part of CK, and I'm going to square this, plus the imaginary part of CK. And once again, this is squared. So in this particular case, what happens is that we know that C sub minus K is due to the anti-symmetry of the imaginary part. We know that for C sub minus K, the imaginary part is going to be negated. But it doesn't really matter because it's going to be squared anyway. So therefore, the magnitude here is equal from the magnitude equation. However, the same logic does not really hold for um, when we look at the phase of CK and CK star. So for example, for CK star, remember that what we do is we negate the, um, we negate the imaginary part. So when we calculate this angle sign here, this angle, angle of uh, CK, so the angle of some CK, equals the arctan of the imaginary part over the real part. All right. Now, if we look at CK star, the imaginary part is going to be negated. But unlike the magnitude, there's no squaring here. So that negation is actually going to flip the phase. It's going to negate the phase. Right? It's going to propagate outside of the arctan. So if you like, you can, as an exercise, see if you can try to, uh, on your own time, maybe reprove some of these properties. We're going to go over a more challenging example together with a check your understanding question. All right, so here's the question. Check your understanding. So this is a little bit tricky. So let's suppose that X of T has a Fourier series. So suppose X of T has a Fourier series. Then what is the relationship between the Fourier series coefficients for CK and C sub minus K if X is an even signal? Okay. So the question is going to ask you to compare and contrast CK versus C sub minus K. So feel free to pause the video and give us an attempt.
Okay, welcome back. So in this particular case, just re uh, as a refresher, here's how you would start. Just as a refresher, in general, we can write CK as being equal to one over T naught times the integral over one period of T naught, uh, T naught plus capital T naught of some X of T, E, J omega naught, Let's write a k here, actually. J k omega naught t dt. All right, so as a refresher, that's the gen general expression for writing ck. Now, without loss of generality, we can assume that in this particular case, we're going to take one period of the signal, and we're going to start from some time t0, right? Because, because the definition of periodic is that it should hold for any time t. I'm going to pick t naught here to be zero, a lowercase t naught. And so that allows me to write ck is going to equal, it'll just make some of the math easier, one over t naught integral from zero to t naught of x of t e to the minus j k omega naught t dt. All right, so now I have an expression for CK. As you may recall from the homework that you are currently working on, we can also write C sub minus K using a similar integral transform. C sub minus K is going to equal 1 over T naught times the integral of 0 to T naught of X of T e to the plus J is going to be plus I'm going to remove the plus so we don't confuse it with a t, but it's plus j k omega naught t dt, right? So we have an expression for c sub k and c sub minus k. And so our goal here is to see what is this relationship. Right? What is the relationship between these two? So what I can do is I can simplify C sub minus K a little bit further. Remember from a previous lecture that if we want to negate the integral, we can simply have one over T naught, we can put a negative sign here, and that allows us to swap the limits without penalty. So we're gonna do a couple things here. The first thing we're gonna do we'll do this more systematically, is I'm going to use green to do a change of variable. So if I look at these two equations and I want to compare them, uh, the first thing, and again, you'll see this in your homework, is that you want to get, if you're trying to compare coefficients, you want to get the complex exponential to be in the same form, because coefficients are, rel are, are with respect to a complex exponential. So if I'm trying to get the complex exponential in a similar form, we'll note that there's a ne negative symbol in one and in the red one, and there's a positive sign on the blue one. So in order to change it, I can just use a change of variable in the integral. So I can define some tau to be minus t, and therefore d tau is going to equal minus dt. And if I do that, then I can simplify this integral as follows. All right, so now we have the integral uh, in this particular form. And you can see now that the signs of the exponentials are similar. What we can now do is we can also note that uh, if we look at the difference between these two right here, if we look at this difference, now the real difference that we have is we have a negative sign in front of one. So let's see if we can remove the negative sign. So to remove the negative sign from an integral, remember that what we can do is if we negate the integral, we can swap the limits. So I was originally going to do this as one step, but let's separate it out. So the first step is you can do a change of variable to get, to, to get from here to here. 
And now you're going to just negate the integral. So to negate the integral, all you have to do is you multiply the integral by negative 1. And then remember that you can swap the limits. All right, now if we look at the difference between uh, the red CK and what we have now, so we're trying to look at this relationship here between uh, in the blue equality three, is the only difference is that X is negated. But since we said that X is an even function, right? We said that X is an even function, we can actually go ahead and simply write this because X is even. We can simply write this as one over T naught integral minus t0 to 0 x of doesn't matter if I use tier tau here but I'm going to use tau x of tau e to the minus j k omega naught tau d tau all right so all we've done is we've taken our signal x of tau and we know that x of tau equals x of minus tau, and that allowed us to get here. All right, so now that we're here, if we look at it, this uh, purple equation that is boxed, oops, this purple equation that is boxed is the same as the red equation in spirit. It may look a little different in terms of what the limits are, but it's still an integral over one period that starts at Instead of integrating from 0 to t, I'm going to integrate from minus t to 0. And that's exactly going to give you the same value because this signal should be periodic. right? It should give you the same coefficient value. So therefore, what we can say is that in this particular case, ck equals minus ck. right? ck equals c sub minus ck. C sub, c sub k equals c sub minus k. OK, so that should be the answer to this CYU. Now, if you want to go one layer deeper, you know, so extra practice is you can repeat the same exercise. What if x of t is odd? So this is a check your understanding at home. All right, so now let's combine some of the facts that we've learned. In this last check your understanding, what we learned is that CK equals c sub minus k, right? If f of t is even and real. So combining these facts, we have learned from here, this is the last question, that for an even signal, c sub k equals c sub minus k. And remember that if f of t was real, we had an earlier question that c sub minus k equals ck star. So therefore, if f of t is even and real, it follows that ck should equal ck star. So in order for a number to equal its complex conjugate, that number has to be real. The imaginary component has to be 0. So it follows that if f of t is even and real, then the Fourier series coefficients, ck, are going to be all real. So we're going to actually end up with real for series coefficients. Those of you who did the check your understanding extension for an odd signal, you would actually realize that if your signal was odd, the answer you should have gotten was that ck equals minus c of minus k, right? It follows from being anti-symmetric. So this follows from being odd. And again, since it was real, you have this folding. That means that ck equals minus ck star. And if this holds, then 
if f of t is odd and real, then ck must be imaginary, must be fully imaginary. So in order for this condition to hold, ck cannot have any real component, right? ck must be fully imaginary. One example that we talked about here was in a previous class, we can just restate. In the previous class, we had a signal as a function of time, and it looked something like this. Oops, let me draw a little bit better. Okay, so we had some signal like this. We had time, and this was the square wave. And so when we calculated the coefficients of the square wave, Right. We got that CK equals one half times the sink of K over two. So in this particular case, what you have is that the signal is real and it's even, right? There's even symmetry. And as such, you see that the coefficients CK are entirely real. So there's no J expression in CK, right? So CK is real. Why is this helpful? Uh, this is helpful for a lot of reasons. I think one of the ways that we commonly use this, this in industry is that if we end up having a signal that is symmetric, and so usually in, in most cases, f of t will be real, right? You're, you have a sensor, it's sensing some quantity like a voltage or something. So your signal itself is gonna be real. Now, when you take a Fourier transform uh, of that or, when you take a Fourier series uh, expansion of a sense signal that's real, if the signal is, has even symmetry, you know that the coefficients should be real. So if you're not getting real coefficients, so if I take this square wave and I compute the CK and I end up with a J there uh, due to some arithmetic error, then I know that should be wrong because I just know from this property that if F of T is, has even symmetry and it's real, and, and real is kind of like a given condition. So basically, if f of t is even, then I know that the CKs should be real. And if I'm not getting a real CK, that's kind of a, a problem. And I can go look at my system to see if there's a bug. All right. So this brings us to the next topic, which is Parseval's theorem. Let's see, I think the yeah, screen is back. Parseval's theorem. So Parseval's theorem says, I have a signal. This signal is x of t. And what I want to do is I want to establish that if I look at the energy of x of t or the power of x of t, Let's write the power, one over t naught times so I'm going to look at sort of the power over one period. This is actually equal to the sum of all the coefficient values. the magnitude squared of the coefficient values, all of them. So informally, what Parseval's theorem is saying is that energy or power in time, you know, has a relationship to energy and frequency, right? So sort of the strength of your signal in time is bounded by the strength of your signal in frequency. So let's quickly offer a proof of this. So let's try to, if we're, if we're asked as a check, so we'll make this a check your understanding, right?
So as a check your understanding, let's say you're asked to prove Parsifal's theorem. Right, how would you approach that? So go ahead and maybe feel free to pause the video and then rejoin us in a moment where we'll explain how to prove this. Okay, welcome back. So to prove this, the first thing that we do whenever we ask to prove an equality is we start with the left-hand side, or you know, really start with one of the sides, but oftentimes start with the left-hand side, and then do some algebraic manipulations. And then hopefully you end up with the right-hand side. All right, so let's take a look of how that would work. So if I'm gonna start with the left-hand side, left-hand side is one over T naught times the integral T naught, T naught plus capital T naught Okay, so I'm just rewriting the left hand side. Now in this particular case, remember that the magnitude of a signal X is nothing, the squared magnitude is nothing but the following. X star of t is the conjugate. Now, I can simplify this as follows. So let me actually write it vertically. So I can write x of t and x star of t in terms of their Fourier series representations. Right? So in this particular case, let's say that this one is green, or we'll keep this one blue. I'm gonna end up with the sum of ck e to the j k omega dot t where k is taken from minus infinity to infinity. So overall k. And the other part, x star of t, is red here. I can write this also as an expansion. In this particular case, I'll use n. I'll have to use a different index so it doesn't overlap. C sub n star of e to the minus j n k omega naught t. All right, so all I've done is I've written the four series expansions for x of t and x star of t. So just by the properties of x star versus x, I have to negate the complex exponential, and I also have to put a star on the coefficient representation. Now what I can do is I can actually simplify this. So this is going to take the form of 1 over t0 times in blue the sum over k, in red the sum over n, in blue ck, in red c sub n star multiplied by this integral from t naught to t naught plus capital T naught of e to the j k minus n omega naught t dt. Now we know from, you know, if we wanted to integrate this guy, we can use our Fourier integration trick, which is that this integral is going to equal t naught if k equals n and zero otherwise. So in this particular case, I can simplify this equation 
as being 1 over t naught times, in this particular case, uh, k equals n. So I only need to write the summation in terms of k. CK, CK star times t naught. Well, I, I can remove the summation because I know that k has to equal n for that integral to have value. And this is nothing but the sum over k of CK squared. And so what this does is it shows you how you can go about trying to prove Parseval's theorem. Parseval's theorem has, again, practical importance. Uh, what it tells you is that your energy in the Fourier series coefficients impact your energy, the strength of your time domain signal. Here's where this is relevant. Let's say that we are designing a loudspeaker, all right? Let's say we're designing a loudspeaker, and the loudspeaker is emitting sound at frequencies that we care about. So let's say it's emitting sound at 440 hertz, uh, which is what we care about. So let me just write a new page here so we can have a clean sheet. Okay, so practical importance of Parseval's theorem. Okay, so imagine you work at a company and you are making a loudspeaker. So you're making the speaker and the speaker is designed to send sound to a human ear at specifically 1,000 to 2,000 hertz. For whatever reason, you want to transmit sound between 1,000 and 2,000 hertz. So you want to optimize your design to transmit sound there. So you make this great speaker, and it's transmitting beautiful music at 1,000 to 2,000 hertz, but you also notice that the signal that comes out of the speaker has a Fourier series coefficient, and has a complex exponential component mixture of that that is at a higher frequency, let's say, So before we had this theory of signal processing and Parseval's um, theorem, people used to say, well, this is not a problem because 25,000 hertz, uh, sound at 25,000 hertz cannot be heard by the human ear anyway. So why do we care that the speaker is emitting sound at 25,000 hertz? Well, the problem is you want your speaker to be efficient and loud. You want your speaker to be loud. And the loudness in time, or the energy that you can transmit in time, is bounded by the energy in frequency. So what this means, effectively, is that if you're spending some of your energy uh, frequency bandwidth at 25,000 hertz, which is useless, this is actually giving you a bound on your time domain energy. And so in order to improve this, you should put more resources in the frequency domain to transmitting complex exponentials at this particular frequency. Okay, so Parseval's theorem almost kind of gives you this intuition that there's no free lunch uh, to what you're trying to do. Another example of Parseval's theorem is exactly the opposite, right? Let's say that your boss tells you that your speaker or whatever can only consume five milliwatts of power, right? Can only consume this much of power. And that power, uh, that five milliwatts of power bounds you in both the frequency and time domain. And so what that means is, let's say that, um, let's say that uh, you're making this speaker. So you make a speaker that transmits sound at this range that you care about. So let's say this is 1000 to 2000 Hertz. So it transmits the sound and you demo it to a customer. So you demo to a customer, and the customer says, you know what, I have two revisions for you. I want it to be louder, and B, I want more
frequency bandwidth. So I, I have a special song that has this one instrument that is playing at a really high pitch, and I want your speaker to be able to capture that. Now, you can justify that you cannot do this without significant changes, because as you start spreading out your signal in the frequency domain, right, spreading out the energy, there's only so much, um, you cannot keep the same energy in the frequency domain between 1000 and 2000, and then magically add energy here, right? Because you're limited by power bandwidth. So effectively what you're gonna do is if you wanna expand the range by you know, 2X, you're gonna have half the strength of the signal. So if you wanna expand it to 1000 to 3000, you're actually gonna reduce the perceived loudness of the speaker at the frequencies that you care about, right? Your transmitting frequencies are going to all change. Okay, so that's kind of like a practical use case of Parsifal's theorem. All right, now this next slide represents a shift in the tone of the lecture. Up until now, we've talked about periodic signals that you can take a Fourier series of. You can have a Fourier series representation of these signals, and you can also find these coefficients if the signal is well behaved and periodic. So this is all well and good, but most signals that we care about in science and engineering are actually non-periodic, right? They're aperiodic. So up in the last couple of lectures, we learned about the Fourier, uh, Fourier series, which can model almost any periodic time-limited function as complex exponentials. But the problem with the Fourier series is it requires that signals be periodic. In the real world, I would argue that most signals are not periodic, right? Um, my voice, right, the, the sort of sound that I'm giving you right now in the lecture, I'm not really repeating the same phrases over and over again too much. So most signals are, non, are not really periodic. So that raises the question if why are we learning about all these Fourier series? So it turns out that the Fourier series is the building block for a more powerful technique known as the Fourier transform, which allows us to calculate the spectrum of aperiodic signals. In this lecture, we'll briefly go over the intuition without too much math and then cover it in more detail later. Intuitively, to go from the Fourier series to the Fourier transform, it's not that difficult. We know that we can calculate the Fourier series of a periodic signal over some interval of length t naught. Now, here is the key, here's the crux right here. A signal that is not periodic, you can kind of view it through the lens of a periodic signal if T0 is infinite, all right? When T0, the, the per period of repetition is infinite, that means that your signal never repeats, that means it's effectively aperiodic. So what that means is that in the math, what we need to do is we need to recast the Fourier series calculation instead of being over a finite period T naught, being over any time from uh, you know, T to minus infinity to infinity. So in other words, the period T is gonna be taken over infinity. And that's the key trick. So on this slide, I just really wanna highlight this distinction right here, that a signal that is aperiodic can be viewed as a periodic signal with infinite period. That's one way to think about how to relate an aperiodic signal into this context that we learned about with the Fourier series. Okay, so remember that intuitively we can calculate the Fourier series f of t over an interval from minus t over 2 to t over 2 via this expression. So we have these standard equations that we've learned. You know, here's your Fourier series representation. And then here's how you find the coefficients over an interval of length t. Now, all we need to do in the Fourier transform, which we'll discuss in the next lecture, is we're gonna rewrite this math, we're gonna rewrite these derivations, assuming that t can go up to infinity. For the, so this will be covered in next week's lecture. All right. The last thing I want to cover today is the homework. So people have uh, expressed an interest in having more homework coverage in the lectures. So I'll try to do one homework problem per week in the lectures for those who are stuck. 
So let's start with this one. This is a pretty difficult one. Show that f of t equals cosine omega naught t is not an eigenfunction of an LTI system. So this is actually on your homework assignment. All right, so let's think of how we would approach this problem. So what we really have here is we have cosine going in to LTI. And if this was, you know, if true, then what we would have out is something like a cosine omega naught t. This LTI system has some impulse response h of t. Now, if we want to, we essentially want to, we just follow our same proof strategy, right? We want to see if the left-hand side is going to equal the right-hand side. So we can simply do plug and chug through algebra. However, um, this question on the homework is worded a little differently. It's telling you the answer. It's telling you that this is not an eigenfunction of an LTI system. So in this particular case, and you will get full credit on homeworks and exams for doing this, it's perfectly valid. You can also simply just solve it via counterexample, which is sometimes easier. So you can do it either ways. So if you want to do counterexample, you know, put in a very simple function for h of t. So h of t can equal delta of t minus 2, for example. I'm going to have a shifted delta function. So if h of t equals delta of t minus 2, I can tell you what the output, here's y, here's x. I can tell you what the output y is going to be. Right? In this particular case, y is going to be cosine of omega naught t minus 2. And in this particular case, this is not a scalar multiplication of x, right? Because it's shifted. I've shifted the, uh, I have a shifted version of the input, which is not a scaled version of the input, which is not an eigenfunction. Okay. So that's one way you could do this is by counterexample. Another way you could do this, and that would be a valid solution to the question. Another way you could do this is to explicitly write out the equations, right? We know that y of t is going to equal the integral of f t minus tau times h of tau d tau, right? So we have the convolution equation that maps input to output. So let's put in cosine of omega naught t. Remember that if we put in cosine omega naught t, let's say f of t, this is nothing but one half all right? So it's more in general when you're dealing with convolution and LTI systems, if you're dealing with sinusoids, oftentimes it's a lot easier, as you are probably noting in homeworks, to e express them in complex exponentials. So we can use that trig identity for cosine that's shown right here. So if we use this trig identity, what we get when we actually simplify this integral is we end up with 1 half times e to the j omega dot t integral over infinity. I'm just going to write minus infinity infinity of e to minus j omega naught tau h of tau d tau plus one half e to j omega naught t minus here integral minus infinity to infinity of e to the j omega naught tau h of tau d tau. Now, if you look, this integral is going to evaluate to some constant a1. This integral here, right here, is also going to evaluate to some constant a2. And in general, a1 is not equal to a2. Therefore, you're not going to get back a cosine.
in general. So this is another way to show that this is not an eigenfunction of an LTI system. Okay, so you also have uh, TA office hours on Friday, so feel free to use them if you're still stuck on the homework, and catch you next time.